Hi there, I'm Mark. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, hardware random number generators um, and broadly talk about why you might uh, need random numbers, uh, some good sources of them, and uh, we'll show you one you can build yourself uh, if you need a source of entropy in your pocket. Um, so, uh, so that's what is they, why do we need them, where can we find them, and yeah, they want to build yourself. So, very quickly, what are they? Five is a random number, so is eight. Um, eight, yeah, could be. Who knows? That's the thing. You kind of need a big set of them to decide whether they're random. Uh, two or three, probably, maybe they're enough. It depends what the application is to a, uh, a great extent. So, uh, but the idea is they're unpredictable, unrelated. Um, generally, you use a uniform probability or a profile of your choice, depending on, again, the application. Um, and they've got a low autocorrelation for offsets greater than one. So if you have a big set of random numbers, they'll obviously match themselves to a great extent, but they'll match other sets of random numbers to a very little extent. So, uh, and that's an important property of them, again, low cross-correlation. So here's a graph of the autocorrelation of a random series that I picked earlier. So when it's correlated with itself, very big. Any other um, uh, offset with itself, very, very small. Uh, and that is useful in some applications which we'll come to. Uh, and there are lots of tests for randomness, because as we saw, sometimes you can get two numbers the same, very close to each other. Is it still random? Well, there are lots of tests you can do to try and convince yourself that <coughs> you've got some random numbers. Um, and I don't intend to go through any of these, in fact. Um, <laughs> because, again, it, it really depends on, on what your application is. If you're playing Cluedo, then you, know, you probably don't need such a great source. You can use a mechanical um, solution. Uh, if you're in crypto, maybe you need something a bit more, um, uh, a bit more reliable. So, <coughs> yeah, different properties for different applications. Not all random numbers are equal, apart from those two we saw earlier. Um, okay, so some applications of them. Um, and I don't know if you've come across Monte Carlo simulations. This is a way of doing uh, numerical integration. So, if you want to cover uh, the parameter space of a of a function, um, which could have basically an infinite, very large space, or an infinitely um, uh, fine space, if you've got as many decimal places as you want, you can use random numbers to sample that um, and get so it starts to converge on the real value of the integral. Used a lot in um, in finance and uh, things like that. Um, we have an odd one, audio noise makers. So you can sometimes find these in alarm clocks. Uh, if you want to get to sleep, it produces a nice whooshing noise, the sound of the sea uh, or a breeze through the trees. And so again with that, you probably don't need a mathematically rigorous random number generator. You just need something that sounds good. Um, background noise in telephone systems so that you know that your, uh, the other caller hasn't dropped the line. Um, <coughs> in older systems, the noise came for free. But the digital systems, uh, there's just no, no noise. So you can create your own and, um, and ruin all that effort in making noise-free amplifiers. <laughs> uh, um, picking premium, premium bomb winners. Of course, Ernie, uh, a great exhibit at the Science Museum. If you get a chance to see that, it just uh, fills a room. Um, uh, but yeah, it's just wonderful, uh, wonderful to see the original Ernie. Um, and yeah, that needs to be... It needs to be fair, and uh, you, they need to get their numbers right because they're paying out uh, when they uh, assign winners. So uh, it's worth their while getting that correct. Uh, <coughs> test equipment, testing uh, frequency response and so on of uh, circuits. CDMA, um, quite an exciting one. If you get a chance to read about this or don't know about it, it's <coughs> terrific uh, um, technique for uh, encoding digital signals. All the GPS satellites use it, um, and they encode their low data rate uh, navigational information uh, on top of a very high rate 
uh, pseudo-random uh, sequence, <coughs> which lets all the satellites talk on the same frequency, and your device can pick them out of the noise because it knows what noise it's looking for. If you uh, think of the autocorrelation uh, graph earlier, there's a very strong autocorrelation with uh, these sequences have a strong autocorrelation with themselves, obviously. Um, and so you can use that correlation to pick out uh, the particular satellite you're looking for out of the noise of all the other satellites. Um, and it's also used in DAB transmission to, uh, if you have lots of regular patterns in digital data, it can mess up the output spectrum of your transmission. You'll get a lot of energy in one particular area. If you mix that with a, uh, a noise sequence, then you know that the statistical properties of that signal are, they have certain statistical properties which aren't affected by the uh, data you're trying to transmit over it. So ironically, the random noise makes the signal more predictable. So, so two sides to it. Of course, the most important um, application is in uh, 1970s sound generators. <laughs> so, of course, uh, you all remember fondly um, Space Invaders from 1978. And this used a linear feedback ship register from discrete, discrete logic to generate noise uh, there's the shift register, and there's a bit of a clock there, and something for squirting some ones into it when you first power it up. Um, and that'll just sit and generate, uh, generate noise um, for the system. And then this is the missile sound, uh, which uses I mean, probably an envelope generator um, to add, some, uh, add an envelope to that. And we can, we can go there, we can listen to that now, I think. Uh, so... So you can hear that that hiss from that um, that noise generator there. And uh, thank you. And now, and now you know what it looks like. So it's exciting. Uh, great. Oh yeah, and cryptography as well. It's um, it's quite useful for that. So <laughs> uh, generating keys, digitalization lectures, so on. And you know, these these numbers, uh, they do need to be. Uh, unpredictable and, and you use once, so um, uh, otherwise you get yourself into, well, it just undermines the uh, security of that system. So some sources of these, so I'm going to probably go through these fairly quickly, but there's two types. There's the true random number generators, which are uh, unpredictable and you know, no matter how much of the sequence you've seen, and then there's pseudo-random generators, and these exhibit the same properties to random processes uh, but they are deterministic, so completely reproducible. Um, uh, predictably unpredictable. So again, those sequences used for the GPS satellites, you need to know, everyone who's got a receiver needs to know what those sequences are. And so you, know, you can tell someone that this is what the generator is, you can still generate that random sequence, but everyone's generating the same one. Is it really random then? So maybe one for the philosophers um, there. Uh, ease of implementing software, very fast. Uh, they are periodic, so um, some of them are quite short. So the Space Invaders shift register, probably a similar length to the number of bits in the shift register. Uh, the one for the GPS uh, precision code takes about nine months to transmit. So that's obviously a, a much much longer one. Um, this is the kind of thing they look like. This is a conventional generator, so it's an iterative function. Um, and by selecting A, X, B, and M, you get a different sequence of numbers. Uh, it doesn't seem to be a very good idea to pick those numbers at random. They don't tend to get good numbers. You might have a short, short sequences or uh, patterns in there. Um, so, yeah, one of those things that I certainly would leave to the experts um, rather than try and build my own. Uh, another source, probably more of a hardware source if you want to build something, is... Uh, the linear feedback shift register. So here's a 16-bit shift register, and we just take some taps at various points, X all them together, stick the output back in the start, and as we shift that along, uh, we get pseudo-random bits out of the end. Um, and that's a nice, simple way of doing it. Um, but again, those sequences are, are sort of related to the length of the, of the number of bits in there, so maybe 65,000 before it'll start repeating the sequence again. Um, 
Mersenne Twister is another one popular. I have no idea how it works. I'm not going to even attempt to describe that one. Um, I opened the book at that page and just quietly closed it again. But um, maybe someone can explain it to me afterwards in the pub. Uh, elliptic curve generators, including dual EC DRBG, which of course is famous because um, it looks like this, so quite similar to the uh, um, congruential generator we just saw. Um, but the exciting thing about this one was that it was claimed that the NSA had compromised this and forced it to be part of um, a standard suite of uh, random number generators. And apparently, apparently, if you could see 32 bits of output for this generator, you could then start to predict um, all the, the rest of the sequence, which clearly isn't great if you're using it to uh, generate um, uh, encryption keys and so on. Um, Bruce Schneier, I'm paraphrasing here, because again, I copied this out of a book in the library, and I didn't write it down properly, but it's, this is the gist anyway. I'd hate to assign something to him that he didn't really say. But these sequences have funny correlations if used in a certain way, and it's these weaknesses that can be used to attack crypto systems. Um, I've got an example of that here. So, um, so this is a very simple, uh, simple example. So this is a linear feedback shift register I've got, um, and it's generating six-bit numbers. <laughs> Uh, and taking pairs of numbers and plotting them in this space. So I'll take X and Y and plot those. And uh, I think we can actually listen to it as well. Um, and so if we just take pairs of numbers, six bit numbers out of this shift register, we get. It sounds like noise, it looks pretty random. Great, okay, we can use that for you know, whatever you want to do with it. Um, but you can have sort of uh, hidden. Uh, hidden patterns within there. And with that generator, if I take numbers out of it until I get a number less than 10, and then take the next pair of numbers and plot that instead, uh, rather, well, if they're unconditional, we'd expect to see the same pattern. We're just waiting for a 10 and then taking the next pair. And if they're all un unrelated and uncorrelated, then we should just see a, a random pattern. And, oh, and we don't. Um, it wouldn't be much of a demonstration if we did. Uh, yeah, there's a, you could argue that there's a pattern um, forming in there. It still sounds pretty, uh, pretty noisy, so you, know, you can't trust your ears. But there it is. Um, that's the kind of thing that can um, yeah, catch you out. And I definitely think uh, those pseudo-random generators are best left to the experts. Um, because you know, the, the the key is you know, encryption keys are the other with the weak point in any um, security system. Um, so all random all these pseudo random generators need a starting state or seed, and again this is where people can make mistakes even with a good a good generator. So picking seeds like milliseconds since epoch or milliseconds since boot, um, amazingly seems to be. Uh, yeah, it seems random, but um, or unpredictable at least. But there's at least two examples I found. There's a hack and use hack where someone could predict um, uh, session keys for uh, the hack and news website uh, based on the fact they knew when the the server restarted. Uh, Planet Poker, um, yeah, a, p a poker site where they found out the seed to the generator, and from then on, you could predict how the cards were dealt, which is clearly an advantage when playing poker. Um, so you need a source of, uh, a real source of entropy that's unpredictable and that's where these true generators come in. So lots of sources of, uh, of randomness in, in the physical world. Um, uh, atmospheric noise, so lightning strikes and whatever, cosmic noise, big bang residue, that's exciting. Um, and this is the kind of stuff you used to get if you tune your analog telly in between channels, static, um, off radios and so on. So that's a great source, um, but possibly prone to interference, quite literally. Um, you know, it's clearly outside source, so you have to be pretty sure that uh, no one's interfering with, with that. Um, but a good source, nonetheless, if you can guarantee it's um, uh, 
validity. But as you've seen, yeah, something can sound perfectly hissy, look perfectly random, but yeah, there are hidden, uh, hidden correlations in there that uh, you know, they might be trying to uh, fool you. Uh, thermal noise, so uh, for instance, uh, carbon resistors, pretty noisy. If you build an amplifier out of carbon resistors, resistors or in fact owned an amplifier in the early 80s, it um, just hissed. When you send it up, it hissed, and that's a nice, nice source of thermal noise. Um, uh, quite a low level, so you know, it's useful, but there are, there are better sources. Uh, radioactive decay, now, this is an exciting one because this is a quantum process. So if you don't, given a uh, radioactive um, atom, you don't know when it's going to decay. And if you've got a whole bunch of them, you know, those, although the overall activity might be constant, uh, you can look at things like time between subsequent decays and use that as a, a source of, of, uh, of entropy. Um, another exciting uh, quantum process is uh, uh, single photons uh, moving through a beam splitter. So if you have a, a beam splitter that's uh, got a 50-50 chance of transmission or reflection, um, if you can fire a single photon at it and measure whether it's reflected or transmitted, uh, you've got, yeah, you've got a, the ideal coin flip. And again, it's, there's no way, even knowing the the, um, having full knowledge of the, of the system, you can't predict that. All the hardware required to produce single photons and measure them, uh, it's kind of, it's not very portable, um, it's kind of expensive. Um, uh, there's probably better ways. Um, oh, diode noise, well, what a coincidence. So uh, this is a great source because uh, they're um, cheap, they're small, they they're not using any outside source. It's all internally generated. Um, uh, they're not without their, their problems, which we'll, we'll talk about. But uh, there are two sort of processes involved in, in, in diode noise, uh, the Zener effect and avalanche noise. So this is how you um, uh, get that, uh, generate that diode noise. So you have a reverse bias diode with a, a current limiting resistor and um, use, a, use a high enough voltage and the junction will break down. And uh, if, you say, if you pick a nice big value for that resistor, uh, it'll be a non-destructive process. So it can just, um, it sounds destructive breakdown, but it's, it's fine if, it's, um, if the current's kept low. It's only the heating effect that's going to destroy it. Um, so we can Zeno breakdown. Now, I should say these, um, these diodes that have a low um, reverse breakdown voltage are generally used for uh, voltage regulators, and they're all called Zener diodes. Um, but there are two effects here, the avalanche effect and the Zener effect. Um, so next time uh, you're buying Zener diodes, you can ask for avalanche diodes and, and see how far that gets you. Um, so the Zener diodes um, have a very narrow depletion layer um, between the, uh, the P and the N side. And <coughs> Uh, when the uh, electric field is strong enough, when you put a large enough voltage on these, those electrons can tunnel across the barrier. And this is another super exciting quantum mechanical process. So, um, again, you have full knowledge of the position of all those, um, of all those atoms. You, could, uh, you, can't, you can't predict this. This is great. Um, and this is the majority of effects in diodes where the breakdown voltage is less than, less than 4 volts. Um, um, and as temperature increases, the barrier level decreases. So the probability of current tunneling increases. So uh, this is my picture of tunneling. It's not very good. Um, and it doesn't really make sense when you say the barrier level decreases because it tunnels. But that's because these things are hard to draw. Um, so yeah, so this has a... Yeah, so if, if these diodes get hot, then their uh, breakdown voltage will, will decrease. On the other hand... There's avalanche breakdown. Um, at high field strengths, uh, the electrons get enough uh, energy to ionize other atoms in the semiconductor, and those, those um, electrons are accelerated and ionize other atoms, and so on and so on. And um, in the end, there's a large number of electrons moving about and current flows. Uh, and this is the majority effect in diodes where the breakdown voltage is greater than 6 volts. Here's another terrible diagram. 
It's like a chain reaction, that's what that's supposed to be. Um, so when it comes to temperature, as the semiconductor gets hot, the lattice starts to vibrate uh, and the scattered, basically the electrons uh, get scattered uh, sooner than if they weren't vibrating. So the, the path between collisions becomes less and so they don't have a chance to accelerate as much as previously for the same applied voltage. And so you need a bigger voltage to, um, to cause the avalanche effect. So Zener process, the voltage goes down with temperature, avalanche, the voltage goes up, and this is a handy way. Uh, if, if, you, if all your Zener and avalanche diodes get mixed up in the box, this is a great way to, to sort them out again. Um, and um, I, think, I think we can go now and uh, actually see, uh, see this effect in action. Um, excuse me. Right. Okay. So I've got two diodes here. One's a uh, Zener diode, um, breakdown of about three, three and a half volts. One's an avalanche diode, so it's about 12 volts. Um, and if we look at the, um, what's that? Let's give me anyway. Right, so this is the Zener diode. So this is without, and this is with. So you can see there's some there's some noise there. Um, purely quantum noise, very exciting. Um, I really think that's more of a marketing thing, to be honest. Uh, don't believe any practical value. This is the avalanche diode. Um, you might notice a slight difference in, uh, in amplitude there. Let me. Uh, Change the scale factor in my very expensive oscilloscope. There you go. So that's the uh, that's the avalanche diode noise, and that's the Zener diode noise. So you know, um, while while the avalanche noise is it's a you know, classical mechanical process, can you really predict that? You can't possibly measure the uh, the, the uh, state of a of the semiconductor. Um, I think from <coughs> as far as the marketing department is concerned, the quantum stuff sounds great, but in all practicality, um, I don't think this is any worse. And it's also got a much higher output, which makes it easier to build one. So uh, I'm going to use the avalanche effect in, uh, um, in this demo. So here's one you can build yourself. It's cheap, it's simple. It has a charge pump, which uh, is what it looks like, by the way. So it uses a 9-volt battery, but it uses a charge pump to boost that to 12, 13 volts. Um, cause breakdown in a reverse biased uh, PN junction. An amplifier, an ADC, and a display. And it just uses a, an Atmel, um, uh, it's an Atmel microcontroller part to uh, do everything uh, from this side. Um, and... Uh, you can even listen to it as well, so it just plays it on the screen. So um, this is the previous one I built, which had uh, it doesn't have the uh, the sound output. So um, feel free to pass those around if you're interested. And uh, in the meanwhile, I'll uh, just show you the uh, the circuit. So um, ironically, it uses a Zener diode in the power supply. But it doesn't use it in the uh, in the noise maker part. Um, there we go. So this is the business end. Um, so it uses nine volts from the from the battery. Uh, uses this diode these uh, diodes to uh, create a charge pump to create a higher voltage here. Um, actually uses a reverse biased uh, uh, base emitter junction rather than a diode because. Um, um, well, frankly, uh, I was buying a whole bag of these things anyway, uh, and it seemed a shame to, to have another part in the uh, bill of materials. And also, it turns out that uh, these, um, these transistors, those, those junctions are really noisy, much, more no much noisier than that, uh, that diode we saw there. Um, I guess they're not designed to be used in this way, and so there's no effort made to make them quiet. Uh, and so it just means this amplifier doesn't have to have so much gain uh, for it to work. So it's part of the sort of um, cost 
um, optimization process. Um, so you could use that as a source of, of random numbers. Incidentally, there seems to be any number of uh, uh, companies out there um, offering different ways to generate numbers, so quantum numbers using light, um, using, using xenodiodes, using avalanche diodes, uh, radioactive sources, you name it. Um, each group says that they're more random than the next group. Um, and I don't know, you can just make, uh, but you can spend as much as you like, if that makes you feel better. Um, or it could be a great opportunity to, uh, um, you know, to, get, in, to get in yourself and, uh, and start selling them. So um, I hope you found that interesting. If you have any questions, I have to answer them. Also, um, I did, uh, well, this isn't probably part of the demo, probably one for afterwards if you're interested, but we can, uh, we can heat up the diodes um, <laughs> and we can see the, uh, the voltage go up and down depending on the, so I can prove to you it's the, the effects they are. Um, IBM was actually right when they said you know, there is a place for the hairdryer in the laboratory. Um, so, um, yeah, if you've got any questions. Thank <laughs> you.